evening and welcome. I'm Beth Hunt in the KATV studios. Thanks for watching tonight. This is the third in a series of webcasts focused on your health that KATV is producing in partnership with CHI St. Vincent. I'm joined tonight by Dr. Mohamed Wakas, cardiologist with CHI St. Vincent Heart Institute at the North Little Rock Clinic. And over the next half hour, we'll be focusing on pulmonary hypertension. We'd like to answer any questions that you may have, so we invite you to submit them right here in the comments section of this web stream. We'll answer your questions as we get them. In the meantime, Dr. Wakas, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we appreciate you being here with us for the next 30 minutes. You work closely with patients who uh, suffer from pulmonary hypertension. What is that and how is it different from regular hypertension? So the word pulmonary means lungs and hypertension means high blood pressure. Uh, so the word pulmonary hypertension in generally, generally means high lung pressure in lung circulation system. So if we put cuff in on our arm, check our blood pressure normally as we go to the doctor and we are told that we have blood pressure 120 or 80 as normal blood pressure. Similarly, lung blood pressure has a certain number. And if that number goes beyond the normal number, then we call it high lung pressure, and which is pulmonary hypertension. How common is this here in Arkansas? Well, I think it, the, the incidence of the disease is a lot more than what we have seen so far. And uh, this, that is purely because we don't think about this disease as much, or use not to at least. And now that we are thinking and diagnosing the disease a lot more, the incidence has gone up. It is it used to be called more of a rare disease, but at least not rare. It's mm -hmm. more uncommon than being rare. And now that we patients and physicians are thinking about this disease a lot more, we are seeing it more commonly. Do we know what causes it or how it develops? So since 1973, we have a lot of uh, work done in the field of pulmonary hypertension. And we had World Health Symposiums on pulmonary hypertension going on since 1973, starting from Geneva. And we have categorized this disease into different categories based on where it is originating from and what, is, what it is affecting. So uh, we, there are different clinical conditions which can be lumped into one category. Overall, World Health Organization has categorized into five distinct groups, and those groups are primarily based on where the primary disease can be. For example, it could be lung itself, which can cause uh, pulmonary hypertension. It can be from left heart disease. It can be from chronic thrombus disease. In some patients, it's idiopathic or unknown etiology. In some patients, it is caused from hereditary uh, transmission of disease. And there's so many other conditions, including infections, which are which push patients at higher risk for developing pulmonary hypertension. What are some of the symptoms of this? So th that is what the most, uh, uh, I shouldn't say puzzling, but the common condition uh, or symptoms with this uh, condition are uh, shortness of breath, fatigue, being tired most of the time, chest pain. And uh, especially with, with, with exertion, these people become uh, very short of breath and fatigue. Now, because heart and lung work together, these, uh, these symptoms of pulmonary hypertension can be masked by either lung condition or any other heart condition. And that is why uh, common practitioners, when they, when they see this, uh, these symptoms, we normally and actually truly should think of heart and lung as a first culprit, but then we go and dig in more deeper, uh, we, can, we find that patient has pulmonary hypertension. So the symptoms can be uh, similar symptoms that any lung and heart condition can, can, can cause, which is shortness of breath and fatigue and being tired leg swelling, and as the disease advances, these symptoms can get worse. They become more prominent and uh, more advanced. Is this something that is hard to detect, or, or, or is it something that often goes undetected in someone? Yeah, I think the latter. Uh, it goes undetected for a longer time. And what we have seen in different registries, that over uh, the, the time it takes from the symptom onset through diagnosis, on average, can be anywhere from two to three years. So sometimes it can lag even more than three years. So depending on the, the suspicion of the disease, the symptoms from symptom onset to diagnosis can be delayed anywhere from two to three years. And also I think it is because that uh, we are not used to seeing this very commonly and not uh, diagnosing it on time either. Right. We talked a little bit about uh, the symptoms. Let's talk about risk factors. Is there anything that makes someone uh, where it would be more possible for them to be diagnosed with this? Yeah. So, uh, like I said earlier, the, because the disease has been categorized into five distinct classes or clinical classes, 
uh, each class has its own risk factor. For example, patients with left heart disease or patients with uh, low heart function or congestive heart failure, patients with stiff heart, patients with bad valvular heart disease, patients with bad rhythm issues, and patients with COPD, asthma, patients with chronic hepatitis infection, patients with chronic uh, uh, DVTs or deep venous thrombosis or clot in their lungs, patients with bad kidney diseases, all of them, these conditions put them at high risk of developing pulmonary hypertension. On top of that, in simple, uh, obesity, for example, is another risk factor for pulmonary hypertension over long term. And chronic lung condition, chronic lung condition can also be a risk factor. So all these conditions together or together or separately can uh, put a patient at risk for pulmonary hypertension. Okay, we're already starting to get some questions online, so I'm going to break away from mine for a moment sure. and address some of those. Donna Weeks wants to know, does pulmonary hypertension ever go away? So, you know, there is one condition which is curative. Once patients are diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension, uh, just like any other condition, like diabetes, uh, we can, we can uh, treat it and make it stable and uh, control the severity of it. Similarly, in pulmonary hypertension, we can control the severity of the condition. In, in one uh, type of pulmonary hypertension, which is from chronic showering of clots uh, in the lungs, that can be completely cured. Uh, in certain developing countries, only uh, certain infections, if they are cured, uh, pulmonary hypertension can go away, but there are only few uh, conditions where um, it can be completely cured. In other cases, which is majority of the cases, we treat condition, treat risk factors, and the severity of the condition gets better. All right. Um, is this something that is difficult to diagnose? Are there any certain tests that you all use to diagnose it and, and also determine how severe it is in a patient? Yeah. So when a patient presents with symptoms of pulmonary hypertension, such as shortness of breath, which is being the most common mm -hmm. uh, uh, symptom, we look for different conditions. We look for heart and lung conditions in general. And one of the tests that we do, which is the most common screening factor or screening test for uh, pulmonary hypertension is an echocardiogram, which is the ultrasound of the heart. That looks at different parts of the heart, different chambers, and, and we can look at and estimate the, the pressure on the right side of the heart and we, if that side, pressure, that side has higher lung pressure, we can do further invasive tests, which is the diagnostic or confirmation test. So initially, echocardiogram is the most common screening test, and the heart catheterization, also known as right heart catheterization, is the diagnostic test for pulmonary hypertension. Um, what is life like for a patient who has pulmonary hypertension? You know, uh, most of the time when patients come in and they, uh, especially when they are being referred by a physician, bef between the referral and, be and when they see me, they have uh, Google most of the time what pulmonary hypertension is. Mm. And quite a few times patients come and ask me, uh, hey doc, I look at Google and uh, I was told that I have only a few more months to live since I've been diagnosed with this condition. So that is actually a misconception. Now, uh, based on the type of pulmonary hypertension, uh, the, the longevity of a patient can be different. And there are some more severe and serious forms of pulmonary hypertension and some other forms are not as, as severe. Yet, once the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension is established, of course, life is not exactly as, uh, as it would be without pulmonary hypertension. Mm -hmm. And uh, the severe, more severe the, the disease is, the expectant, life expectancy can go lower. That is why we wanna diagnose the disease earlier so we can treat it on time, so they improve not only quality of life, but also increase more years to someone's life. Um, if this goes undiagnosed, I would imagine it would lead to other complications. What are some of those things that could happen? Absolutely, so as the, we have two main chambers of our, of our heart, right and left. The right heart pumps blood into lungs, from lungs it goes to the left side, left side pumps it back to the body and comes back to the right heart. And the right heart, as it's pumping into lungs, if the lung pressures are high, the right heart starts to struggle. Over time, the right heart can start failing and can lead to more complications, such mm -hmm. as the swelling of legs, swelling of belly, losing of appetite. And then eventually, if the heart gets stretched too much, the right heart can fail or stop. Now, those, that is where the, the advanced disease turn comes into, where uh, conditions can, uh, of pulmonary hypertension can lead to advanced right heart failure. Um, we know that um, there are treatment options, and we have someone on our Facebook page who has asked if, if you've seen results, any good results with the current medications that are out there today. Well, absolutely. Uh, 
again, uh, the treatment strategy about in pulmonary hypertension clearly depends on the type of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, I, there are multiple examples of different conditions and different risk factors which can lead to different diagnosis. For example, uh, the most common treatable cause of pulmonary hypertension is to treat its risk. Uh, patients with bad congestive heart failure, if we treat their heart failure, the pulmonary hypertension gets better. Similarly, uh, if we treat certain lung conditions such as sleep apnea, pulmonary hypertension will get better. Now, there's another subset of a uh, little uncommon kind of pulmonary hypertension, uh, which is, which is uh, lumped into the World Health, World, Health, uh, World Health Organization Group 1, with what we call targeted therapies are indicated. With those, uh, we started in late 90s uh, with IV therapy, and now we have about 14 plus medications FDA approved, which are approved for uh, treating those with that very specific condition. And those therapies have not only improved quality of life, but also improved survival in those patients from months to years. Uh, I have a few patients who are what we call, they are veteran of pulmonary hypertension. Mm -hmm. they, have, they have survived and they survived with these medications. And as we treat, uh, we have two goals. One, improve quality of life, and of also uh, determine their risk of dying or risk of getting worse over a period of time. So we reevaluate these patients very commonly, very frequently. And then based on the risk, if the risk is or disease is getting worse, we escalate therapy based on their risk. If risk is getting better, then we can maintain the same therapy. And uh, the, the theme is to go aggressive from day one. If we treat aggressively, the disease severity can get better quicker, there's less strain on the heart, and patients can live longer with a better, better quality of life. Okay, we have a, a viewer with a question. This is from uh, Dina Weindorf. She says, is there a hospital in Arkansas that does operations for pulmonary hypertension? So the answer is, uh, right now, there is one condition which, in which a true operation is required to treat a certain type of pulmonary hypertension, which is a pulmonary hy hypertension from chronic showering of uh, clots into lungs. We have only few centers in the whole uh, United States who are experts in, in doing that operation. Basically, the operation entails uh, opening the chest and taking all the clots out of the lung. And uh, even from, from Arkansas, we send those patients over to those specific specialized centers so that they have best outcome. Mm. Um, other than that one condition, uh, there are not many operative or surgical therapies which are uh, indicated for uh, pulmonary hypertension treatment. So um, we have successfully uh, done few uh, procedures to, to improve quality of life, but when it comes down to taking those clots out, those patients are sent to uh, those specific uh, uh, centers to, to have their surgeries done. Okay, Pamela Lambert is watching tonight. She wants to know, is there a certain age that people are most likely to be diagnosed with this? Uh, That's a great question. Uh, based on uh, the different types of pulmonary hypertension, the, the age can, can vary, but more commonly, this is the age of uh, from between 35 to 65 and 75 is where this disease spreads into, just like most of the other conditions. But based on, again, the, the risk factors and what category uh, the patient can fall in, uh, that age can vary. For example, someone, uh, a young woman with history of lupus is at a high risk of developing pulmonary hypertension at early age, in the 20s and 30s. On the other hand, a patient with uh, uh, heart and lung conditions such as COPD, asthma, a patient with heart failure, they are, they are more prone to develop pulmonary hypertension at a later age in their 50s and 60s. So the determination of age is based on the risk factors and underlying condition which can put them at higher risk of developing pH. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit more about treatment options. You've touched on it some and how those options have changed over the years. So we have come from uh, an era of late 90s where we had uh, one IV therapy as a treatment for uh, pulmonary hypertension to now where we have uh, about 14 plus therapies in the form of, in the pill forms and in the IV forms. Mm -hmm. Based on the, the severity of, the, of, the pulmonary, of pulmonary hypertension and the risk factor or the risk, or the risk of dying from pH, uh, we ascertain what and strategy will be the best and how many of those medications will be used to uh, improve the quality of life. So in 2018, uh, the, the, the latest symposium on, uh, uh, from WHO was done in Nice about pulmonary hypertension. And now the recommendation is that 
if patient is diagnosed with at least moderate pulmonary hypertension, to go as aggressive as possible with more than one medication and, and hit it hard in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So bring the lung pressures down as much as we can uh, with the combination of medications uh, based on uh, the severity. And then evaluate it more frequently down the road and see how the pressures are. If the pressures are coming down, we stay the course. If they are not coming down, they're going higher, then we keep on adding medications until those pressures are, are down enough. Now, based on uh, the risk if is of patients high risk with low heart output, or if they have severe symptoms, then from, the, from get go, we start with IV medications. Now, when we start those IV medications, those medications are supposed to be running from, trans from infusion port or on a PIC line or a indwelling catheter that runs 24 seven. Mm. That requires some specialized teaching, specialized drug delivery, and we have a few patients in our community who are already on uh, those medications, and they are doing really well. What is their quality of life like on these medications? Do they have an effect on them? That's a great question. So the quality of life before starting therapy is really bad. So these are the patients who, are, who can't even walk from their uh, bed to the bathroom. They get the short of breath. Mm -hmm. And once we start them on therapy, they go back to almost normal life, back to work, back to shopping, back to Christmas shopping, back to being with their family. So it, it produces a dramatic difference in the quality of life. Yes, the trade-off is now they have to take care of an IV line or they have to be responsible for changing the, the cartridges that come with the IV line. But the gain is their impressive quality of life that can be improved dramatically with these medications. Yeah, we talked about the medications, the IVs. Is there any sort of lifestyle changes that people could make to improve this condition? Yeah, so uh, the risk factor modification or risk factor stratification is, is, is one of the key things in any disease prevention. And um, uh, we, as healthcare providers, we advocate uh, that patients take care of their own health before it gets too late. For example, uh, if someone has history of uh, or risk factors for COPD, smoking should be completely, uh, completely stopped. Patients with sleep apnea, they should make sure that they are evaluated and treated for sleep apnea. Patients who have uh, conditions which can lead to congestive heart failure, they should be very well ident identified and treated. So treat taking care of risk factors can be uh, the first step to prevent a disease, and if it gets worse, then of course it can be treated. We have several questions, uh, people wanting you to go over the common therapies for the different stages again. So uh, let's talk about uh, the categories where those specialized medication therapies are indicated. Um, and that is actually the smaller group of patients. The larger group of patients are where in, in old ages, we used to call it a secondary pul pulmonary hypertension, where some other disease was causing that. But now that terminology has been thrown out of the window. We have now different conditions, for example, uh, patients with uh, 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 hepatitis C or patients with cirrhosis can, can have uh, pulmonary hypertension. But if no other cause is identified, we, we lump those patients into an idiopathic or unknown etiology of pulmonary hypertension or patients with, uh, who have heritable uh, pH, patients with drug-induced pH, more commonly amphetamines. Uh, and, and methamphetamines can lead to pH as well. Now, when we define by heart catheterization that those patients will fit in the category of treatable pH, then we start them based on their severity and how high the pressures are, we target with one, two, or three different therapies. There are three main pathways of pH or treating pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is a specific targeted area. And those three pathways are uh, different uh, and hitting different pa different part of the circulation, and those are more enzyme and receptor based uh, pathways. And we hit or try to hit at least two in the beginning. And if the disease is in severe range, we often start with actually a combination of three therapies at the same time. And if the hard output is too low, then we start with a combination of two pill forms and one IV form. I have a patient at this time in the hospital who, has, who had, was undiagnosed uh, severe pulmonary arterial hypertension for a very long time. And today we started on a combination therapy with uh, uh, dual or uh, oral tablets and then an IV form as well. We have um, another viewer who's asking a question tonight, Susan Hensley Evans. If you have immediate family history of pH, how likely are children to have it? It's a great question. Uh, 
uh, over the last five years, there's, there's a huge focus on diagnosing congenital or, or heritable pulmonary hypertension. If a patient's family member has a diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension, especially females, mother, sister, uh, cousins, first degree relatives, in them there's high risk of developing pulmonary arterial hypertension uh, in, that, in that cohort. And there are a few pathways that we have identified and, uh, and in certain patients we can offer genetic counseling and genetic testing to define if certain gene is modified which can lead to pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, how do you work with patients as they learn to live with this condition and, and it become their new normal? So we, uh, b because this disease is a very uh, advanced specific mm -hmm. disease, we have developed a program at CHS in Vincent which is uh, specific to pulmonary hypertension. And that, that includes, of course, for, as a physician, but also we have a, a pulmonary hypertension coordinator, nurses, we have a pharmacist, and a dietitian. And we have a whole team that takes care of these patients. So it's not just one stop shop. It's not just one person mm -hmm. treatment. Is in one stop patient gets to see all these people because we have to make changes in their diet. We have to make changes in their treatment strategy. We have to make changes in their overall rehabilitation programs. So all these factors come into play and we interact with, with one patient as a team. And over time, that patient becomes our family life. You know, and, and that is one of the biggest gain that we, we get from this, treat, seeing these patients, that these patients become a part of us as a team and we work together. We, we define goals. We define short-term goals and long-term goals. And once we, and we define what will be the treatment strategy to reach those goals. Those are monthly goals, there are some quarterly goals, and there are some yearly goals. And working together, most of the time we achieve those goals. I understand that for a long time, patients would have to maybe even travel out of state to be treated for this. How has that changed? So uh, until you know, we started this program at CHI, uh, a lot of these patients who required advanced therapies, especially when they required IV therapies, mm -hmm. they had to travel out of state to Texas, uh, Tennessee, or Kansas, uh, or Missouri, or Oklahoma. And, um, and these patients were traveling anywhere from between three to six hours to go to those centers to get the treatment. And there was, of course, a big strain on their traveling, on their health, and being that sick, they had to travel for that long. But now, those patients are coming here to our center, and there are a lot of patients who have transferred their care from, from those centers to us, and we're taking care of them in Little Rock. So uh, we are very proud, happy, and actually blessed to have this, uh, this program going on CHS in Vincent so we can offer not only uh, the diagnostic part of it, but most importantly, the treatment part of it. Um, and short of maybe one or two uh, uh, advanced surgeries, which are very uh, advanced surgeries, other than that, we have the whole uh, armamentarium of treatments that we can uh, offer in Little Rock. What is the life expectancy for someone with pulmonary hypertension? And how important is early detection in all of this? That's, that is, I think, one of the key things to understand. And it's a great question to know, earlier the diagnosis is, longer the left, uh, life expectancy is. So if someone is, comes in with a, uh, with a good uh, functional status and is a, a disease is at an early stage, if it is started early, the, the life expectancy can be longer. Of course, the life expectancy of a pH patient is not like a normal pulmonary, normal patient without pH. Yet, if, if we can diagnose and stabilize the disease, the, the life expectancy and quality of life can get significantly improved. But if the disease is diagnosed at a later stage and it is already way far advanced, we can improve quality of life, but then we have to use advanced therapies in the form of IV medications to improve survival and we can gain two or three or four years or maybe even longer. There's some patients who are living on IV therapy for over 10 years mm. with those. So again, it all depends on how aggressively it is diagnosed detected and then treated so aggressively to improve those years and add as many years as possible. It's got to be rewarding as a physician to see someone um, struggling and go through some of these therapies to, to have such a better quality of life after they've seen you. Of course, uh, I think that is the gain of our, uh, our daily work. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we get to meet these patients and we I have, not just I, our team has made phenomenal friends uh, in the form of patients. And we have, we are actually more blessed that uh, we have uh, very robust and very uh, aggressive patient groups in, in Little Rock and Arkansas. 
Um, our central Arkansas group uh, is led by a patient who, is, who has pulmonary hypertension. And she's a veteran. She's been uh, <clears throat> leading this group for, for a few years and has been one of the key members in uh, not only disease uh, detection, but also uh, advocacy at, at, uh, at, in, 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 our, in our government. And this, those patients, they meet quarterly, they, meet, they get together, they have lunch, and I attend some of their meetings, and uh, we sit down, eat lunch, and have informal discussions about the disease, how to live with pH, how to live with a disease that is such entailing and is aggressive. And I see these patients coming in with their oxygen tank, with their oxygen on. Still they come there, talk, get together, and actually have good time. Um, and that is what gets, gets us going every day. Those patients who are not able to walk before, now they can actually come out, not only meet each other, but also go out with their families. Yeah. If there are people who are watching tonight and they have a family history of this or they're a part of any of those risk factors and they have some of those symptoms that we talked about earlier, what do you encourage them to do? So uh, the key thing is to uh, discuss this with your physician. If you have symptoms of shortness of breath, which are not explained by any other condition otherwise, you should ask your physician, do I have pulmonary hypertension or not? And the simple test that can be done to at least estimate or screen for pH is to have a uh, cardiac or heart ultrasound known as echocardiogram. Echocardiogram can give us a lot of ideas about our, our geometry of the heart, how high the heart pressures can be, if the heart function is low or high, or is a stiff heart. And once we have those ideas, we can uh, easily estimate if this patient may or may not have pulmonary hypertension. If the pressures are high on echocardiogram, that is where we get more aggressive and uh, start for the testing. Okay, Dr. Mohamed Wakas, thanks for being with us tonight. We learned a lot of great information with you and we appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right, and if you would like to learn more about pH, heart attack awareness, the latest treatments, or heart healthy tips, you can go to chistvincent.com slash heart. And if you missed any part of tonight's web stream, you can catch it anytime right here on the KATV Facebook page. Again, thanks for being with us tonight. Have a great night.